Uh, dear Heavenly Father, we just thank and praise you so much, Father, for being here today, Father. I ask that you stand in my body and, and use me, Father. Speak forth your word, dear Lord. Let them go forth to your people, dear Lord. I ask you to prepare their hearts and minds to receive them and let it accomplish uh, the, the outcome that you have in mind, dear Lord. Um, we ask that your words be taken in, Father, that be good seed in the fertile soil, Father, that they affect and change lives, dear Lord, and share with others. We love you, we praise you, we acknowledge you, and we thank you for the bread of life. In the mighty name of your Son, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, it's good to see you all here today. Um, all, always good, right? Always good. And uh, at 8 o'clock, I, I shared an old saying. He said, it's always better to be see, seen than viewed. So I'm glad to be seeing y'all than and, and viewing. Um, today we're going to talk about faith, and we just wrapped up a four-week Bible study on faith that I was—I had the pleasure of teaching. We called it a faith boot camp, faith boot camp. Um, and the 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 purpose of that was to really get us to look look at faith uh, deeply. Um, and I'm I'm telling you, man, I went for a ride on that. It it, it so much was revealed to me in the process of preparing and delivering those teachings and, and what I learned in the interaction with, with, with the folks that were in attendance. Um, because faith is one of those things that we talk about all the time. Like we, we church folks, right? We, we, we say faith a lot. We say it a lot of times, right? The word comes out of our mouth frequently. Um, and we talk about having faith and needing faith and us or other people needing more faith. And we, we toss that word around. It's, it's one of those church cliches, if you will, that we hear all the time. And even responsibly, we recite scriptures and, and, and talk about biblical concepts around faith. But many times we don't have a true understanding of what faith is, what it's for, what it looks like. And it gets more complex because faith is not just a necessary part of our salvation relationship with God. But we have this, this thing about faith, right? Because some part of our, our human sinful nature tells us that faith is, is, is power. Right. Faith is something that we have that we can use to get what we want. Right. So so our, our human nature feels something associated with faith and 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 it, it, it makes us feel like we have a little bit of extra control. We like that. Right. So some part of, 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 of us wants to take faith and run with it. Well, today we're going to go through a lot of scriptures so have your notepads and pens ready and really try to uncork the mystifying game great understanding of what faith is and what faith is about. So we're going to start with the definition of faith, right? So I'm going to ask you to turn your Bibles to the book of Hebrews, the book of Hebrews, chapter 11, and the very, very first verse, Hebrews 11, verse 1. And I love this scripture because it's, it's just a straight definition. It looks like a, a Webster's de definition entry. There's no imagery or interpretation or poetic metaphors. It's just a straight definition of what faith is. Hebrews 11.1 1 simply defines faith. And it reads, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. The substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things unseen. And you can look through, I put three different, four, actually the, the King James and New King James are identical, but multiple translations on the screen. You got to look really hard to find a translation that says something, you know, markedly different, right? The, the faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. And if we break that down a little further, we'll see that there are four basic components of this definition. There are four basic components of the definition, substance, hope, evidence, and unseen. And it's important to, to look at these elements uh, to understand faith and to utilize faith in our lives. Substance, when faith is at hand, we have to be addressing something of substance. It doesn't have to be material or monetary, but it does need to be something that we can tangibly recognize. A job, a promotion, love, a first date, a court date, money, time, health. It, it, it can be a lot of different things but the best way I can say it is you will notice a change because we have to be talking about something of substance. The second one is hope. And faith actually starts with our hope. See, the substance has to be something which we hope for. 
right? Or faith is not going to apply. Within this definition of faith in Hebrews, the Bible uses the Greek word elpizo for hope. Now that means hope. Okay, there's no, again, there's no, no mysticism um, about that. But it also means to expect something, right? So there's something beyond hope in its purest sense because there's a level of expectation. Expectation kind of anchors your hope, right? It's, it it kind of wraps your hope in reality because you can hope for anything, right? But for you to have an expectation, then that, that brings it into a, a concept of, of reality, right? So this tends to separate what we want from what we hope for. The third component is evidence. Now, evidence is something that shows you or proves the existence of something else. This Bible isn't God, but the truth of the Bible and my ability to see the words jump off the pages and interact with the Holy Spirit in me is evidence of God's existence. Through this Bible, I know that God exists. Okay? And then the last component is the word unseen or the phrase not seen. And this relates back to the word hope, for we don't hope for something that we already have or for which already exists. So faith is when something of substance that we have a desire and expectation for but cannot see becomes evident anyway. Okay? When something of substance that we have a desire or hope for, even an expectation for, but cannot see becomes evident anyway. When your hope becomes your reality, in a supernatural way, that can very well be based on your faith. It is your interaction with God over a transformation from a situation you don't want to a situation that you hope for in a way that is beyond what you can naturally see. Now stay with me because there's a difference between faith, belief, and knowledge. I know this podium is here because I can see it. I can feel it. I picked it up just yesterday. I picked it up. I moved it over there after the, the service. I brought it right back here. I've seen others do the same. I've touched it. You cannot convince me that this podium is a figment of my imagination. That is knowledge. I know this podium is here. I believe that I can lean on this podium without it falling. I can look at it. It appears to have the structural integrity the wide base, the right height, the right weight, where I believe I can lean on it based on what I see and not have a problem. I believe that. It would take faith for me to hope that this podium could hold my entire body weight. And only after trying it successfully will I have any knowledge about whether that's true or not. Okay? So look at it this way. In this image on the screen of a canyon, we have hope on one side and belief on the other. Now, if you want to go from the point of hope to the point of belief, there's nothing in this image that you can see to get you there. The pathway is not evident. There is substance, though, because there are two peaks. They, they physically exist. And you have the hope to get from one to the other. So the question becomes, how do we get from hoping for something to believing? in something. And I submit to you that the way to do that is through faith. So it takes faith to get you from what you are hoping for to what you believe. Now look, hope is easy. Like I said, you can hope for almost anything. It doesn't take parameters or foundation. You can hope to hit the lotto as much as you can hope to live to be 121. But remember, the definition also encompasses that Greek word, elizu, which suggests an expectation also. Your expectation can keep your hope in check. Expectation is when you wrap your concept of reality around your hope. Hope doesn't involve any accountability. You can hope to be a zillionaire even if you work at McDonald's your whole life. Never buy a lottery ticket and never look for a hidden treasure. Right? And, and your reality does not have to define your hope. Okay? And that's actually a good thing because that's where faith comes in and lets us see beyond what we think is possible. Now, belief is tricky. Belief is tricky because we can act like we believe something. But there is something inside of you that is tangible, that controls what you truly believe. You can't really believe just anything. You can act like you do. You can say you do. You can claim it all day long. But something inside of you has to happen in order for you to truly believe something. 
Therefore, belief does hold you accountable. If you truly believe something, there is something about what you say and do which will come out of that belief. Now, my favorite example of this is after this service, when I get to that door, I'm going to stick my hand in my pocket for my keys. I'm not hoping my car is there. I believe my car is there. I expect it to be there mainly because that's where I parked it. Now, you can tell that I believe it's there because before I see it, I start reaching for my keys as if it were there. Now, look, I've, I've been some places where I wasn't so sure, where I had to look first. Say, yes, car is there. And then I reached for the keys, right? But, but um, the point is that the act of grabbing my keys before I see my car is a result of my belief that my car is still there. When I get there and get into my car, then I know that the car is truly there. We can see all of these concepts at work and build a foundation for them by looking at salvation. We know that belief in God's supreme existence and his son Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior is the foundation for salvation. To be saved, you must traverse from hope of salvation to belief in salvation. That takes faith. If you're an atheist, you don't believe in any God or any religion. So you have no choice but to believe that at the end of your life, that's it. You just die. You have no hope of any future beyond this life. So as a result, atheists live this life in a manner which considers only this life. In fact, we sometimes wonder how someone can be an atheist knowing that they will be condemned to a devil's hell. Well, if you're an atheist, you don't believe in the devil or his hell. So you're not going to act like you do, okay? Salvation, on the other hand, that process involves us transforming our belief of certain death into one of everlasting life, life without God into life with God or even for God. Without faith, we cannot comprehend this process. So it doesn't make sense to those who don't believe. However, when you have faith in the truth of God's words, you start believing the necessary step, that God is God, that he created the world, that he loves us that he gave us free will, that we were separated from him by the acts in the garden of evil, that, that he gave his son so that we could rejoin him, that his son is Jesus, that Jesus bore our sins, died on the cross, that he was resurrected, ascended to heaven, gave us the Holy Spirit, and that by believing in him and accepting him as Lord and Savior and confessing that with your mouth, that you can be born again and have eternal life. Amen. This transition is all about faith in God and his word. And because of this faith, we have hopefully transcended to the point where we believe the word of God. Through that belief, we are able to accept his son, Jesus Christ, as Lord and Savior. This process, among other things, overcomes death with eternal life. It gives us access to an all-powerful, loving God who created everything in the universe, but still took the care to number the hairs on your head. This entire process begins with hope, because I don't believe that you can put yourself in a position to hear and accept God's word unless you have a hope for something better in your life. All right, so let's start looking at some of the scriptures here. Well, we're going to start looking at 1 Corinthians 2, verses 13 to 14, and all the scriptures today will be on the screen. 1 Corinthians 2, verses 13 to 14. The Bible reads, These things we also speak, not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but what the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man does not Receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. In other words, spiritual things are discerned spiritually, and carnal or human things are discerned humanly. In 1 Corinthians 1.18, the Bible reads, For the message of the cross is foolishness, and some translations will say folly, to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. So here we see there's a difference between the believer in Jesus Christ and the non-believer, what one dedicates their entire life to and believes with all their heart is pure folly or foolishness to the other. This is why evangelism is so important. Side note, evangelism classes are starting soon. Sign up in the foyer, see Sister Naomi. All right. It takes a lot to get someone from a place of unbelief to a place of belief. It's also why we have to be very careful in dealing with unsaved folk. We have to accept their reality that their discernment is not spiritual, it's carnal. 
And carnal discernment tells them that believing in a God that you can't see and a risen Savior is foolish. Now, I didn't make that up. It's in the Word of God. But we have to understand that that's what we're dealing with when we're trying to talk to someone about Jesus Christ. We can't assume that it makes sense to them because God has already told us it doesn't. Okay? Now, let's look at our main scripture text for today. At this point, I'm going to ask you to stand, if you can, without great difficulty. We're going to read this powerful, packed scripture aloud uh, from the New Living Translation. It's 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 to 7. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 to 7. The subtitle is The Hope of Eternal Life. Let's read it all together with a nice, strong voice of authority. All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is by his great mercy that we have been born again because God raised Jesus Christ from the dead. Now we live with great expectation, and we have a priceless inheritance, an inheritance that is kept in heaven for you, pure and undefiled, beyond the reach of shame and decay. And through your faith, God is protecting you by his power until you receive this salvation, which is ready to be revealed on the last day for all to see. So be truly glad. There is wonderful joy ahead. Even though you must endure many trials for a little while, these trials will show you that your faith is genuine. It is being tested as fire tests and purifies gold. Through your faith is far more precious than mere gold. So when your faith remains strong through many trials, it will bring you much praise and glory and honor on the day when Jesus Christ is revealed to the whole world. May, the God, may God add a, a blessing to the reading and the hearing of his holy word. Thank you. You may be seated. So today we're going to look at this scripture, 1 Peter 1, 3 through 7, and pull it apart and see what it teaches us about our faith. And I'm going to, I'm going to tell you now, you got to buckle your seatbelts on this one because it's really going to take you somewhere uh, and really change how you talk about faith, how you experience faith, how you recognize faith in your life, and truly boost your understanding of faith. The first point is that faith gives us access to God and his righteousness. Faith gives us access to God and his righteousness. And the supporting scriptures here, we're going to start with 1 Peter 1, uh, verse 5, and it says, and through your faith, through your faith, through, through, through your faith, God is protecting you by his power until you receive this salvation, which is ready to be revealed on the last day for all to see. And over in Romans chapter 5, verse 1 reads, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Back to 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 8 to 9 reads, You love him even though you have never seen him. Though you do not see him now, you trust him and rejoice with a glorious, inexpressible joy that takes faith. The reward for trusting him will be the salvation of your soul. And so we see in these scriptures that through faith, we establish a special relationship with God. Our faith in God yields us access to him. It gives us access to his protection, to his justification, grace, and ultimately salvation. Let's look at a few more scripture. Open Hebrews chapter 4. Verse 16, let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. In time of need, you're not going to go boldly somewhere that you don't believe exists, right? In Hebrews 11, verse 6, it says, but without faith, without faith, it is impossible, not difficult, but impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Again, you won't diligently seek something that you don't believe in. And lastly, in Romans 4, verse 1, and this, this is a, a recitation by, by Paul of, of Genesis 15, 6, it says, Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. In other words, he believed and had faith in God, and that's what made him righteous, not, not his own uh, doing or capabilities. So we see not only that faith is the basis for our relationship with God, but it's a necessary part of that relationship. Without it, the relationship does not exist and cannot exist. Here we see faith granting us mercy and grace and the ability to please God, reward, and ultimately even righteousness. Now, do you remember our bridge from the earlier slide? Well, just as faith joins 
our hope to our belief, it joins us to God. It creates an exchange or a highway between each of us and God. And it's on that highway our exchange, where our exchanges and interactions with God occur. <coughs> this is extremely important because that highway is a two-way street. Our faith isn't just a permission slip that gives us the right to ask God for what we want. We may treat it that way. We may treat him that way. But the highway is the basis for an incredible relationship where everything about us can interact with everything about him. So the next time you think about faith, think about it not as this loose concept, but that it's the, the very foundation of your relationship with God. It is the way we get to God is through our faith. Okay? Our second point about understanding faith is that faith brings or keeps you or us under God's protection by his power. Faith brings or keeps us under God's protection by his power. Now, this is when learning about faith really starts to bend your mind a little bit. So let's look at some more scriptures here. Going back to 1 Peter 1, uh, verse 5. Through your faith, through your faith, God is protecting you by his power until you reach, reach salvation, which is ready to be revealed on the last day for all to see. James 4, 7. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. And 1 Peter 5, 8 through the 8 portion of, of 9 says, but sober, be, I'm sorry, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Resist him steadfast in the faith. Now, that first scripture in, in Peter takes us back to the faith highway of the slide we show, right? We gain access to God's protection through faith. So beyond what we can do for our, ourselves, Right, faith unleashes God's power and God's protection. Now, I don't, I don't know about you. That sounds pretty good. I mean, I mean, I, I know God can protect me with His power better than I can protect myself with mine. And look, I, I'll take, I'll take all the protection and power I can get. If you all want to protect me, that's great. If you want to protect me with all your power, that's great. I appreciate. I will applaud you for doing that. Right, but ain't nothing like God's protection and God's power. Right. So that that power is a superpower. Right. It's all powerfulness. It's omnipotence. It's and it's for as long as you need, because that scripture says it will protect you until you receive this salvation, which is all which is ready to be revealed on the last day. So until the end, when we don't need it anymore. Right. For all to see. We then see in James 4, 7 and in First Peter 5, 8, that we have an active adversary who we must resist and remain steadfast against. No wonder we need God's protection. <laughs> you realize that if a, you do realize that if a lion is pr prowling around you, you're in trouble. How many of y'all seen a lion? Okay, it's not the little cute Simba Lion King, okay? Them suckers are big and fast and mean and ruthless, okay? Um, and if, if you are in the position where the prowling lion is around you, he's got you. You're not going to outrun him. This ain't a Tarzan movie. You're not going to beat him up and swing up in the trees, right? But the scripture is so powerful because we all know that our instinct would be to run or just cower down. But God tells us to resist and be steadfast. That means we've got something beyond our abilities that we can stand on, that we can look him in the eye and stand strong, not because we are big and bad, but because God is the biggest and the bats. Let's look at some additional scriptures to show you how our, our faith in, it activates God's protection. In Genesis 15, the Bible says in verse 1, after these things, the word of the Lord came to Abraham in a vision, or Abram at this point in a vision, saying, do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your exceedingly great reward. And over in Ephesians 6, verse 16, when we're looking at the, the whole armor of God, it says, above all, taking the shield of faith the shield of faith, the shield of faith, which will, which with, with which you will be able to quench all, all the fiery darts of the wicked one. This is a protection and power that we truly need. As the other scriptures tell you, we need God's power. We need that power to protect us against the fiery darts of the devil. You got darts and they're fiery. Okay. Uh, we need that power to resist the devil, which is 
the resistance of temptation, right? And then we need that to be a, to avoid being devoured by the devil, which is our, suscept, our susceptibility to disbelief and doubt, okay? So faith is God's protection. And we tend to think of faith as a tool or even a weapon that we use to get what we want out of life. But look again at Ephesians 6.16. What part of the spiritual armor is faith? It's the shield. That was a mind blower for me. Maybe it was a mind blower for y'all over here. Because I've always thought of faith as something that I can use to unlock the power of God and, and, and attack things and get what I want. And, and all these things that I had were, were that about faith were in my mind were aggressive. It was a weapon, a tool, something that I could use. And then I, I, I slowed down and looked at this, and it said it's a shield. It's a shield. It's his protection. God said to Abraham, I am your shield. He didn't say I'm your sword, your machine gun, or your magic wand. He said I am your shield, right? And having promised Abraham that he would be the father of many nations and have endless descendants, which Abraham didn't even ask for, by the way, um, God said, I will be your shield. I will protect that promise that I made to you. And all of this was because of Abraham's faith. In 1 Peter, and again, the first part of Ephesians 6 show that faith is a protective mechanism. It's God's protection. It's a shield. So if you break these scriptures down, you will see that the shield of faith protects us from outright attacks of the enemy, blocking those fiery darts. And in fact, it doesn't just block them. What does it say? It extinguishes. So they come, okay? It, it, it protects us against that temptation of sin, okay? Again, we need to resist that temptation. It, it, it protects us from being consumed by doubt or disbelief in the face of which we have to remain steadfast. Why does this shield of faith protect us from these things? This one's easy, because we need protection. <laughs> because we have a sinful, doubtful nature that will allow these things to devour us and attack us and, and dislodge God's blessings from us if we let it. So I know that sounds a bit obvious, right? But there are things that we allow to come in between us and God's promises. The next point is our faith is shown to be genuine in our many trials. This is when it starts getting hard. We don't like this. I highlighted the word many, but I didn't make it up. Okay, our Father is shown, our faith is shown to be genuine in our many, many trials. Let's look at the scriptures. First Peter 1, 6-7, where it comes from. So be truly glad. Don't you just want to stop there? You know, I just, it's a wrap, right? There is a wonderful joy ahead. Oh, maybe that's even better. But can we stop there? No. Even though you must endure many trials for a little while, these trials will show that your faith is genuine. It is being tested as fire tests and purifies gold. Many trials. And then look at how your faith is tested. It's not a pop quiz. It's not a fill in the blank. It's tested by fire, the fire that purifies gold. In James 1, verses 2 to 4, very familiar scripture. My brethren, count it all joy. Can we stop there? Can we just count it all joy? Count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Now, we want the beginning, and we want the end, right? We want, we want to count it all joy, and we want, to, we want patience to work its perfect work, and we want to be perfect and complete and lack nothing but we don't want the trial and the test is in the middle, okay, right? And we have to start understanding and realizing that it is those tests and trials that have value to us, okay? Romans 5, verse 3, and not only that, but we also glory, can we stop? We also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, and perseverance, character, and, and character hope. We want the beginning, we want glory, we want character, we want hope. But we don't want that middle part, right? Now, I'm going to give you a moment to digest these scriptures because if you're anything like me, you're still stuck on that first one. 
Many trials? Really? Many? Well, it's many because this stuff isn't easy. Remember, faith converts foolishness and folly into firm belief. And I submit to you that this is part of our daily inner struggle because we think carnally or like the sinners that we are. We say, wait a minute. That doesn't make sense. I'm not turning the other cheek. Vengeance is mine. That's how we think, right? All right, let me stay on track. Let me stay on track. Okay, that's another sermon there. All right, let's, let's look at one more scripture on this. Let's look at the 66th Psalm, Psalm 66, verses 10 to 12. And the Bible says, For you, O God, have tested us. You have refined us as silver is refined. Side note, silver is refined the same way as gold, that heat. Okay. You brought us into the net. You laid affliction on our backs. You have caused men to ride over our heads. We went through the fire and through water but you brought us out to rich fulfillment, okay? You can't just walk up on the rich fulfillment part. You have to go through the trial, okay? These are difficult scriptures to embrace because they challenge our human sinful nature. While people enjoy talking about the struggle they went through, most people don't want to go through the struggle, okay? I, I, I have st stood by the concept that I can always bring football into a message. God made football. It's okay. It's almost football. So for the football star, I was watching Hard Knocks, right? Hard Knocks is the HBO show where they go into the training camps when they got 104 players and they got to get rid of 51 of them. They got to cut the roster down to 50. So you get to see these guys working out and their, their ups and their downs and folks get sent back and you see the whole thing. So you had this player. He's a great receiver, great receiver. And he wasn't working hard. Right. And you, you hear them say all the time when people don't work hard and do their best in practice, they say it's contagious. Right. So he wasn't working hard. They're looking at this guy as a leader. He's relatively new to the team. And so they, we're going we're gonna to put him through a trial. We're going to teach him a little lesson. So they bumped him down to second string. Boy, he was hot. He came in the coach's office yelling. And if you don't, if you're not going to play me and trade me. Well, it's all right. And they trade him. OK. Now, he got a $4 million contract. Don't worry about him. He's going to be all right, right? But he didn't get better through that interaction. He didn't step up and go through the trial or through the test that they put before him, right? He didn't engage in that, so he didn't grow as a player, okay? The fourth point is we strengthen our faith. Don't look for more. We frequently hear and talk about the concept of more faith. We hear people saying, I need more faith, or you need more faith, or more likely not at this church, other places, so-and-so needs more faith, right? Um, and, and we even do things that we think are going to get us more faith. We, oh, I'm, I better go to church every week. I need some more faith. I need to read my Bible extra long. You know, I need to pray extra hard. You know, we, we do these things because we, we, we think of this concept of getting more faith. Like it's something that we can accumulate. But let me tell you, you now have all the faith you're ever going to have or need. You don't get two shields. You don't get three shields. You don't get 50 shields. You don't go get more of it. You strengthen it. See, we think of faith as an offensive weapon. So we think I need three or four swords in case one of them breaks or gets stuck or I need to get two people at once or you know, I want a quiver full of arrows so I can just keep shooting, keep shooting, keep shooting. But remember, faith is a shield. And the Bible tells us that we strengthen our faith, not go get more of it. It's quality, not quantity. Again, let's look at some scriptures on this. First Peter 1, the B portion of verse 7 says, So when your faith remains strong through many trials, it will bring you much praise and glory and honor on the day when Jesus Christ is revealed to the whole world. Now, it's interesting. It says it will bring you much praise and glory and honor. Your faith will bring you much glory, praise and honor. But it's got to remain strong through many trials in order to do that. In Romans 4, verses 19 to 20, talking about uh, Abraham, Paul says, and not being weak in faith, which means you can be weak in faith. He did not consider his own body already dead. And when they say dead, they're talking about his ability to have children. He did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, 
giving glory to God. So you see that he could have been weak in faith. I skip. He could have been weak in faith. That really blew it, huh? He, he could have been weak in faith, but he was strengthened in faith. So if we start thinking about this strengthening of our faith as opposed to getting more faith from somewhere, like, hey, can, can you got some faith? That I can, you got some extra faith that I can have? Can someone give me, can, is there some faith on No, there ain't no faith on you. If we think about strengthening our faith as opposed to trying to accumulate it, we start looking at it a little different. Because first we have to acknowledge it can be weak. Okay? One doesn't want a weak shield. But first Peter tells us that our faith remains strong, that our faith remains strong through many trials. And in Romans, we see that Abraham was not weak in faith, but he was strong in faith. In, that, in fact, he was strengthened in faith. So in this process of the challenges and the trials, our faith is made strong. Oftentimes, Abraham is referred to by many as the father of faith. And this is primarily because of Paul's rendition of, of what happened in Genesis uh, chapter 12. Abraham was in a situation where God's words to him seemed absolutely impossible. He was 100 years old. His wife was 99.9 .9 years old. They hadn't had children all this time. Now they might have blamed her. It could have been him, right? But bottom line, they were way too old to be having any more kids, right, or uh, to have any kids. So God promised him descendants which could not be counted. God instructed him to sacrifice the only child he did have. I mean, a real sacrifice with a knife and some burning wood, okay, firewood. So you talk about many trials. That's a million trials in one. But Abraham's incredibly strong faith was made even stronger by his belief and trust in God at that very moment. So we quickly recap on this point. You have faith if you believe in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. You've been given your shield. Your shield becomes stronger the more you use it steadfastly to successfully defend against temptation, sin, fiery darts, susceptibility to that prowling lion, and the less you need to see that shield in order to use it. And your faith is weakened when you don't use your shield and you fall into temptation. So there's some interesting new things that I learned here, and hopefully you did too. It completely changed my perspective on faith. The concept of faith as a shield was definitely a mind blower. But praise God, we can consistently see in his word and work on strengthening our faith. Amen? Amen. But wait. I still got some of you. I blew the slide and still got some of you. There's more. Because there's something else about faith that really throws us off. And it's based on scripture. There are a series of scriptures which have shaped our notion of faith. In Matthew verse, chapter 7, verses 7 to 8, it says, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be open to you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds, and to him who knocks it will be open. Matthew 18, yeah, we like that one, don't we? Matthew 18, verse 19, there no trials in that scripture, is it? Matthew 18, verse 19, again, I say to you that if two of you agree on earth concerning anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there in the midst of them. Matthew 21, verse 22 says, and whatever things you ask in prayer, believe in you will receive. Sounds pretty good. Ain't no trials in there, tribulations, no fiery darts, no lions. That sounds pretty good. But wait, there's more. We come to the scripture now that I call the ultimate faith challenge. And this is where the, the faith boot camp we did. This is what we started. With. The ultimate faith challenge. And it's found in Mark 11, 22, 24. And I, I, they didn't get this at 8 o'clock. This is the first scripture I memorized. First scripture I remember, right? Uh, which, which, is, which is a bit shameful, but it's come full circle. Because <laughs> okay? I like this scripture. I can get what I want, right? So I memorized it quick, right? Because I can get what I like getting what I want. I like, I like what I like, right? So Mark 11, 22 to 24 says, So Jesus answered and said to them, Have faith in God, for surely I say to you, Whoever says to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea, 
and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says will be done, he will have whatever he says. Therefore, I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. And that doesn't that make you just want to go out the door and, and say, mountain, move into the sea. Right? This, this scripture presents a challenge to Christians. Because I don't know, nobody in here believes they can go out and tell that mountain to move into the sea. This time. No one has a 100% track record on, on their prayers being answered. Okay? I don't, if, 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 if y'all do, then God bless you. Y'all need to be up here preaching. <laughs> okay. But, but I, I, I can't profess that, and I've never heard anyone do it. So we, we, we try to figure out how, how is this possible, right? And that's why I call it the faith challenge, right? And the answer is it's quite simple because the scripture points out that this happens whenever there is no doubt in the heart. That's in verse 23, and it refers to believing when you pray, which is in verse 24. Belief happens at the end of that faith highway we talked about. And it happens on the God end of that highway, not on the us end of that highway. Belief is not how bad you want something. Some people think they can pray and just say, I believe, 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 I believe. If you got to do all that, guess what? You don't believe. That's why you're trying to convince yourself that you do believe, because you don't. Okay? Abraham, I'm sorry, and so, so, the, to have that assurance, that that lack of doubt, okay, the 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 thing that you're believing on, the thing that you're hoping for, with evidence unseen, must be something that God has promised you, right? Not not that you can't ask for something else, not that you can't receive a blessing. I don't want people to con confuse this. You can you can you can fall into a blessing by luck. You didn't even know it was up. Wow, bam! Oh, blessing. Okay, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about declaring something as truth and, and calling upon it. It's interesting, uh, someone mentioned to me earlier, the scripture that says, call upon things as though they, as, that are not as though they were, ain't true. God can do that. He said you can do that. He said God can do that. Okay, <laughs> so the, the point here is that when God has made a promise to you, only then can you have absolute belief. Right, because our simple nature is not going to let us think up something because we thought of something different last week. Think up something new and have absolute belief in it unless it's within God's will. Right, so it's not a trick bag. If you can do it, then it'll happen. But you can't do it unless it came from something more reliable than yourself, and that 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 is God. If you look at Abraham, Abraham just wanted a kid with his wife. He didn't go to God and said, "Make me the father of many nations and give me." More descendants than the grains of sand and sea. He didn't ask for that. He said, Can I have a kid with my wife? But God made him a bigger promise. And, it's, and, and he had doubts about the little thing that he wanted. But when God promised him all these great things, guess what? He believed it and it came true. All right? Noah, Noah just wanted to please God. And Noah could have just stood there and said, God, are you pleased? And God said, Yep, I'm pleased. Noah would have been straight. He was cool. Right? He didn't say, God, I really want to get some cubits and build a 50 cubits. I want to build this ark, and I want to care for all these pairs. Noah didn't ask for that. He just wanted to please God. God said, okay, you're going to please me, but this is how. And what did he do? He said, oh, okay, and he did it, right? It came, it came to fruition. Moses, the last thing Moses wanted to do was to go into Egypt and leave the Israelites out. He tried to get out of a bunch of times. What do I say? What do I do? They're not going to listen to me. I can't even talk straight. You know, Aaron, do it. Right? He, there's a last thing he wanted. There's a last thing he wanted. Right? But when God made the promise, what did he say? Okay. Yes, sir. Okay. And then it be, and, and he, he he was able to do that. He marched in, the, in there asking for their freedom or demanding their freedom. He didn't say, uh, can we make a deal here for the people? We'll still come back every now and then and make y'all some bricks and whatnot. No, he said, let my people go. He commanded. Them. And when they said, no, he said, all right. <laughs> right, he had faith. And he didn't say, all right, giving up. He's saying, all right, so he can get up out of there before the flies and everything else hit, right? 
So he 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 had faith. He knew it was going to happen. He knew it was going to happen. He didn't doubt it. If he doubted, it, he would not have gone and risked his life. Okay. So it is when, um, as I said, along that highway, when our interactions with God and our relationship with God is so strong that we we He makes us promises and we hear those promises and we're in touch with those promises. That is when we can believe in them. And that is when we can go in prayer and pray for things that we know are of God's will, not just our will. Right? God's eternal, stable, steadfast will, not our fickle change of the wind will. Right? And truly believe in something that we can't see without any doubt at all. That takes God. So when our will becomes his will, we will have no doubt and truly claim what God has ordained. Amen.